Okay, so uh, good morning. Uh, I'm uh, pleased, and I suspect you are too, to be past the last quiz. Um, uh, we will discuss the uh, solutions to that quiz. Um, I don't know if we're going to have a chance to do that at the end of class today. I have my doubts because we have a, a full agenda in the, uh, the talk I'll be delivering. Uh, if we're unable to do so today, we'll do so on Tuesday, uh, our final time together, where I'll be leading you through a glimpse of what I consider the frontiers of uh, dynamic modeling. Uh, one of which, um, and in some ways two of which, uh, relate to the material we'll be speaking of today. Um, today we're going to be looking uh, at a vignette again on COVID-19 and, and specifically our work uh, here in the Computational Epidemiology Public Health Informatics Lab in delivering services for uh, our health authority, our Ministry of Health, and indeed for Public Health Agency of Canada and for uh, First Nations and Inuit Health Branch of Health Canada. Um, and uh, we'll be offering this vignette, however, also as kind of a way of introducing a couple um, important points of, of understanding and perspective. Uh, number one, uh, the ways in which dynamic models of the sort we've talked about in the class with those three different traditions um, can be combined with uh, computational statistics slash machine learning uh, to, to render models that are recurrently regrounded with data kept current as it were with the latest evidence um, and which help in making sense of that evidence as it pours in from the external world. But rather than, than just comparing with this evidence that's coming in with the model remaining unchanged, the models being, being always updated with it. Not merely parameter values being adjusted, uh, although that does go on for dynamic parameters, but with the model's understanding of the current state of the system being uh, cross-checked and corrected by virtue of data from the world. And uh, we'll take a look at how that process takes place um, at, at a broad level. Uh, this is a subject which with these particular techniques, which are, are Bayesian statistical techniques to, to combine the dynamic world uh, model with data from the world, there's actually roughly four levels at which you can understand it. Um, uh, sort of a level of, of sampling and important sampling at the basic level, a level of the, uh, the applied probability theory and so on at the level above that. Um, and, and some about the model implementation and or how it's, how it's implemented and, and almost a philosophical level. And we'll concentrate more on the, the two upper levels uh, here. Um, but we're also going to use this as a um, as a glimpse of a more general trend, which is, I think, really an important one, um, and in a more general um, approach, which is is really to turn models from being discrete products that one's built are more or less fixed and provide, you know, ongoing um, uh, ongoing guidance with respect to a start state that's increasingly further in the past into things which are, are, are living, uh, living documents as well, or living, living models, um, models that really are services um, that constantly give new, new insights and new refreshes based on um, the data from the world and are updated, reflecting that data. We're gonna be going from open loop models where the model one's built is more or less inured from the the, the external circumstances, but just used to understand it distantly um, into models that are tied up with what's going on in the world in the sense that they're always being updated um, by, by encounters with data from the world. Um, their sense of what's going on in the world is always being uh, cross-checked um, and squared with what we see from the world. Um, but at a, at a level that I hope will speak to you as computer scientists, 
this vignette is also going to be a, um, uh, is also going to showcase ways in which computational technology can play such uh, an incredible role. And indeed, uh, our success within this area, within our lab, is reflective of the fact that we are trained as computer scientists and we can leverage the full toolbox of computer science um, to, to build the requisite infrastructures to, to implement the data engineering pipelines, the model pipelines at scale, run them in a distributed fashion and even leverage things such as uh, GPUs uh, or prospectively FPGAs to really accelerate model performance, to take, to take this to a whole nother level in terms of the ability to deliver services uh, on an ongoing basis. And you'll see that woven in, particularly in the later stages of the talk. So with that preamble, that guidance as to sort of where we're going, I'm gonna switch over to my screens and I'm gonna to have to abbreviate my discussion to, to finish up within an hour here. Um, and that will go require going quite quickly through some slides which we're not able to dwell on, but which I'd be uh, glad to discuss uh, next time or, or in office hours today. Um, okay, uh, I trust that you folks can see my screen right now. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, so this work comes out of um, uh, our lab, um, uh, many of whose members are shown there uh, faithfully prior to the uh, pandemic. Uh, that was at the end of uh, 2019, uh, about a month before we started following the pandemic, uh, the, the outbreak in Wuhan in, in detail. Um, and I wanna particularly cite uh, Xiaoyan Li, who happens to be one of the TAs for the course um, and hopefully is watching this as well. Um, uh, and for her, um, for her leadership, really, in, in building these models, these so-called particle filtering models, these models combining machine learning and dynamic modeling. But I also want to uh, cite the leadership of Lu Jie Duan, um, who built up this incredible infrastructure in its uh, first, second, and probably third iteration. Um, before it was joined by a set of others, including two within this class, uh, Eric Redekop and Aaron Todorash, um, uh, to, who, who took it to another level yet in terms of ease of use, um, productivity, uh, cross-checking and, and error prevention, um, capacity to, to have sort of a degree of fault tolerance and recover from errors easily, et cetera. And, um, uh, all of these uh, individuals uh, were really instrumental in making possible what's been achieved to date. And what I'm really excited about is, is another stage of work. Um, I also need to cite um, uh, the uh, many others who have supported this work in various ways. Jenny Basran at the Health Authority is now qu quite, uh, quite knowledgeable about particle filtering. Um, and dynamic modeling. She is the senior information officer at the health authority and in charge of digital health. This is an area she wants to hire in. So for anyone who's interested, um, uh, I'm sure be, she'd be delighted to, uh, to meet folks. Um, uh, but uh, Juchin Liu, math and stats, who maybe some of you would know, um, a, a fellow faculty member was instrumental in, in really getting us um, uh, set up with a lot of these analytical methods um, some years back and has served as a, a font of, of ongoing wisdom about the computational statistics, machine learning side of things. That's an area where I do a lot of work, but where she has the, um, the depth of statistical knowledge that is incredibly valuable. Um, and also the, the funders who, who made this possible, including within our province, uh, elsewhere in Canada, multiple grants from Public Health Agency of Canada and succession, and from First Age, uh, Nations and Inuit Health Branch of, of Health Canada. And really, this was part of the COVID-19 analytics program uh, that, um, from which you heard about another model uh, last time. Um, and uh, in this context, the work was uh, designed to inform uh, public health and acute care and, and strategic planning um, uh, decision-making by the health authority and the Ministry of Health, 
with lots and lots of meetings directly with the top medical person in the province, uh, Dr. Uh, Saqib Shahab. Um, and this particular component concentrates not on the ABM, but on um, a combination of, of uh, dynamic modeling and, and machine learning and computational stats. Um, and in some ways, what this is about is making sense of a cacophony of evidence. So public health decision makers across the world uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, but well before that with respect to countless other conditions, have a devil of a, a, devil of a struggle um, taking uh, increasingly rich data as the years go by, the data is increasingly rich and making sense of it. So, you know, here's data from New York. I'm not easily able to show you uh, data because of confidentiality agreements for all our diverse data sources within uh, our province. But this is, you know, data from New York, which um, has many, many similar um, uh, time series in it, whether it's uh, test volumes, such as shown here in gray, whether it's new cases, such as in brown. Um, number of currently hospitalized individuals or test positivity and in, in um, so the fraction of tests that turn out positive in orange um, or indeed um, this these ICU numbers you know there's a this is this cacophony of, of evidence from the world that's being produced daily or multiple times a day and decision makers have to look at this and try to make sense of it and you know, often what they're looking for is a narrative, a story. What's going on behind this? You know, what what underlies this? Why do we see this? What in the world is going on that would make sense of all these different sides of the elephant? What's the underlying elephant? And I hope coming out of this class, you have a sense of where dynamic modeling fits in there, because dynamic modeling is about simulating the elephant. If, if I can bring bring that analogy in, in a weird way together with uh, computation. Um, it's about making sense of the elephant, grappling with the elephant as a whole. Um, and viewing these various lines of evidence as kind of different facets of this underlying whole, different faces of this underlying situation. Um, and of course, uh, that perspective gives you a better understanding, for, for example, uh, for how to make sense of case numbers in a context where we're testing more and more, more and more frequently. And there's a natural question there. Well, you know, these ups and downs we see of cases, how much of that is, is really due to changes and how the bug is spreading and how many people really have it versus how good we are at finding them. And this goes on in countless conditions, infectious diseases, chronic diseases, environmental conditions, et cetera. Um, and this, this talk is really about using dynamic models to do this with data in a way that they're constantly being refreshed with data. And it's, it's taking models out of the province of, of kind of once built, just used um, into things that are, are part of services that are, that are providing guidance, providing feedback, providing new interpretations on an ongoing basis. Um, and it means taking many lines of evidence and making sense of them in terms of the underlying elephant, the whole, the what's going on, and then saying, what does that tell us about these things we can't directly observe? Whether it's the effective reproductive number, or this force of infection, this chance per, say, day that uh, if you go circulate in the population, you'd get infected, whether it's the number of people out there that are that are sick with COVID and don't know it, how behavior is changing, et cetera. And having done that, having sort of made sense of the current situation, of course, with the dynamic model, we can project forward. And we can project forward in what if scenarios that would say, if we put in place a stronger, you know, a stronger injunction against travel from the south of the province to the north, how much time would that buy us in terms of the spread of, of these new variants into Saskatoon or, or into PA uh, or even further north? Now, part of the, the idea behind models is, up, you know, rendering models as updated services rather than as these kind of discrete products um, is this idea that, look, um, 
uh, models um, are learning tools. And we talked from the very first day about models as learning prostheses. They're not crystal balls and they shouldn't be used as crystal balls. And look, even the best, most informed model constructed with the very latest evidence at the time it was built, constructed with the very finest of characterizations of things in the world, the most, most uh, clever and, and sort of thoughtful, judicious way of representing these things. It, it's a fool's errand to look for it to accord with all data from now on. It's inevitably going to diverge. And there's many reasons for this. It's gonna have approximations that were reasonable at the time, but, but you know, don't hold uh, behavior changes. There's issues with, uh, with change of, of external things uh, that are outside our control, you know, the economy or aspects of what's going on in other, other countries that are outside the scope of the model. And there's also this thing called stochastics, which, you know, the chance event that this person went to the snowmobile rally last year with COVID and served people food and, and beverages off of plates and infected a whole swack of people. Or that worker from Curl Lake in Northern Alberta who um, happened to catch it, happened to catch COVID-19 when he was on a shift with someone else and then brought it home to La Lache Clearwater fatefully. Um, you know, these are stochastic events we can't possibly expect to anticipate, but we want the model to, to stay true to what's actually happened in the sense, okay, that happened. We, yeah, sure, maybe we couldn't anticipate it, but, but given that it happened, we want the model to kind of stay savvy to it and say, okay, well, what now? Just in the same way, you know, with a GPS system, if we miss our turn, we, we expect it to, to tell us, okay, you know, where to turn next. Um, okay, we might not have been able to, to go the way we wanted, but, but you know, what, what, what course of action do we have best now? So we want a model that, that stays, stays aware of what's going on. And the vision that we came up with years back, this is 2014, 2015, when we were really pioneering this work, myself and Zhu Xi Liu, um, was this idea of, you know, having models that, we can formulate quickly, like really early in an outbreak, like COVID-19, where we started our models in February and where by early March, this time last year, we had a stable of models that were you know, pretty good, including a particle filtering model um, due to Xiao Yan's um, strong efforts. Um, and the idea is, you know, um, we'll have these models, they'll be roughly put together but over time, they'll be sharpened, they'll be regrounded, they'll be kept honest, they'll be kept corrected by virtue of data that comes in. They'll be kept current with the latest evidence uh, in a way that, that keeps, them, um, keeps them relevant um, and keeps them ever more savvy to the external situation. So the idea is to take, take our, you know, we've, we've been conducting models predominantly in a blindfolded way worldwide. This is true of most COVID-19 models. They're built and then they're used. And, you know, unfortunately, some of them undergo bit rot and no longer are used or they're, they're used. But then at some point you say, oh man, now this thing is getting really old. It's projecting still from January, 2021. And here we are in April, it's time to recalibrate the model. And you begin, you know, a lockdown period of modeling for one month to, to update the model. This is about taking the blindfold off the model while it's running and, and letting it see. To, to use another analogy I, I'd like to employ, ladies and gentlemen, um, this, this analogy that works much better with students in the classroom. I asked them, you know, um, each of you knows your way home from this classroom to your home very well. You've been that route countless times. You have a very good mental model of it but how many would trust themselves to take that route with their eyes closed and with their ears plugged up? Uh, it would be, you know, it would be a fool's errand. It would be disastrous. It could be fatal, right? Um, even if you live close to campus, you might head across campus drive when the light's not, when, you know, when the light is green for cars passing you, 
when when the pedestrian signal isn't on, you'll get hit and and by a car. It, it's horrible, right? Um, uh, we depend constantly, even for the best of mental models, on feedback from the world, on seeing what's really going on and correcting our mental model, where we are, you know, uh, whether it's safe to to cross that road, um, which which route is the best route uh, to walk on because of uh, the packed snow, et cetera. So in the world, we're constantly depending on data. And it, so it is with real world models used in other areas, right? I mean, you think about weather models. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, we live in Saskatchewan uh, for those in this class, right? And, and um, a model of weather for you know, the end of this week that last had data put into it of even April 1st, never mind January 1st. It may be the best model in the world, but projecting forward from, from April 1st to you know, April 10th or April 11th uh, for this weekend would be, would be crazy. I mean, the, the, model, um, the model's going to be, uh, the weather model's going to be way off for its expectations. It's going to be a lot less accurate for what's going to go on this weekend than a model that every three hours is regrounded with data that's constantly told, okay, this is, this is what happened. This is when the cold front actually arrived. This is how much humidity was actually measured. Uh, it might have been a really good model, but um, you know, it's not going to be able to anticipate those exact stochastics, those timings, those uncertainties. So with weather forecasts, we keep our models constantly updated to reflect the latest evidence. Um, and it's not because the model is bad. It's, it's just a reality that we can improve its performance a lot more if it's constantly regrounded with this data. And so it is, was the, was the thought with these, um, with these models for in the health sphere and in COVID-19 in particular. Okay, so the idea here is look, you have the model learn over time. Um, you have it observe not just what it expects for things like cases or the number of people tested over time or the number of deaths or the hospital admissions and census, people overnight in the hospital or, or for the, the intensive care unit. Um, but you actually, you actually tell it what those are over time and you have it sharpen its understanding of, of certain changing parameter estimates. And most importantly, sharpen its understanding of the state of the model. What's, how many people are there out there who are likely, you know, uh, undiagnosed infectives? Um, what is people behavior um, likely to be in terms of mixing patterns? And most recently, uh, in a very exciting development, we've been bringing this together with some novel data sources, uh, including wastewater data. Um, we're, we have plans to, to extend that beyond wastewater. Um, in other areas, we've secured great value using similar methods with things like social media data or search data, which while lower quality than this sort of health data coming directly from the health authority, it's, it does provide other information. And the idea is the model learns from this. Um, it sharpens its understanding and that understanding is tested in the crucible of evidence and adjusted each day. And then we project forward at any given point with this most savvy model about where we are now, we look forward. So look, it's like a GPS, right? I mean, um, uh, again, you might've thought you'd turn here, you couldn't. Um, and so it, the GPS system knows where you're actually at. Uh, it knows you, you didn't turn there. And so it's gonna give a, a better guidance as to what to do next uh, compared to you know, just a list of, of um, directions on how to get from A to A and B. A GPS is always understanding where you're really at and recalculating based on that. And that's what these models are when we ask what if questions. They're always knowing where we're at, so to speak. Now there's three major methods of relevance here. Um, and we early on explored uh, MCMC, Mark Markov Chain Monte Carlo methods. Um, but uh, our main uh, workhorse has been particle filtering and so-called sequential Monte Carlo um, methods. Uh, we also apply, and, and Jeremy Ung, my, my a doctoral, uh, excuse me, a postdoc um, under, under me is doing a wonderful job further advancing particle MCMC techniques, which take particle filter to another level. 
now the idea here with particle filtering is, and I know not all, everyone has uh, gotten exposed to machine learning. Uh, there's probably a fairly small subset of people, but the idea here is that we are, well, we actually have a distribution of possibilities of what the underlying state of the system is. X is like a, a vector at any one time of the current state of the system and one to T, um, the subscript indicates at time one or time two or time three. So we're trying to estimate what's that distribution of what is the case in the world in light of the data, um, in light of the data that we see and in light of model structure capturing how the system evolves. So this is a technique we've applied in many other areas, um, uh, many of relevance to this prov um, province. Um, and uh, they include many uh, infectious diseases as well as other things such as opioid overdoses um, uh, su for suicide prevention and um, understanding the challenges of, of that, um, as well as for um, some things within, uh, within a, a given person. Okay, a little bit of understanding about how this works. Um, okay, so we take a dynamic model and this dynamic model in order to sort of be useful to, to engage in particle filtering, this technique of keeping it always grounded, it, it needs to include some stochastic processes, okay? It, it can't be totally deterministic or it's not gonna gain anything from particle filtering. It, it needs to have some variability, some possibility that unexpected things happen. And so the way we incorporate that is with stochastic processes. And often these are stochastic processes involving certain parameters, like the contact rate between people. We don't know how it's gonna evolve or maybe the degree to which testing, how efficient testing is in finding people is another example. Now, um, if you take that system dynamics model, let's say with stochastic processes, um, for the most part, we're gonna run that forward um, according to its normal uh, rules with a twist, okay? Uh, because we're gonna do so thousands of times um, in parallel with different stochastics. And those will be associated with these so-called particles, okay? And the idea is that each of these particles between um, observations, it's just gonna evolve according to the normal rules of, of system dynamics, okay? It's just gonna go forward according to the normal rules by which any logic simulates a model. But when there's an observation, the state, understanding of the state is gonna be corrected, okay? Um, and the way this is performed allows it to be done recursively. So what this means is when, when a new data point comes in, it can use the results from previous updates together with this new data point to get a new understanding. It doesn't have to go back and, and go through every previous data point. It can just sort of incorporate this new data point into its understanding by combining it with, with the, the findings from older data points um, earlier in the model. And the fundamental way it's doing this is by running the model with these competing hypotheses about what's going on. And these hypotheses are termed particles, okay? And so um, don't be confused by the fact that you have a big model and particles are within it. Each model cont contains a complete hypothesis about the state of the, the system. So each particle has within it, if you thought about this applied to SEIR models, the model we have is much more complicated than that, but imagine you have a, uh, even just an SIR model, okay, an SIR model. Each particle has some hypothesis for how many people are in the S, S state, some hypothesis, how many are in the I state, some hypothesis for the R state. And these different particles disagree. One says, I think it's, I think everyone's susceptible and there's no one infected and no one recovered. Another one will say, oh, come on, you're full of it. I mean, you, there's lots of people infected the number of susceptibles is pretty high, but there's quite a few recoveds as well. And these, these particles compete to explain the data. They compete to make sense of what's going on in the world across many data sources. So they reflect this kind of competing hypothesis and there's this survival of the fittest of them. 
as to which explains the data best. And the way in which we capture that survival of the fittest is these things called weights. So the weight of this is, is a particle. Um, a particle is associated with each particle. Each particle has a weight. And it's kind of a measure of its credibility. If it cries wolf too many times, if it says, you should see tons and tons of, of new infected cases reported today, and there's very, very few, its weight will be downgraded. Um, if it says, you know, there's going to be pouring in of people into the ICU and almost no one comes in, I say, oh, come on, uh, you know, it'll, it'll lower its weight, it'll push down its weight. And um, meanwhile, if a particle is right on the mark, it's saying, well, look, you're going to get one or two people for the ICU, but that's all. And maybe, you know, 30 to 40 for the, um, uh, for the number of new cases reported. Um, it will, uh, and you actually observe 45, it'll say, hey, you're, you're pretty good. You're pretty on the mark and it will up its weight. And there's the survival of the fittest with the things with high weight tend to flourish tend to be multiplied and the things with low weight of a chance of dying out. So let's go down one more level. So you start with your ODE model. Can this be connected with ABMs? Yes, uh, we have done so. Uh, it takes a lot of work and any logic is not an efficient vehicle for it. We have to build our own frameworks. We've done some of it um, and uh, there's a lot of work to be done to take it to the next level. If anyone's interested in projects, um, that's, a, that's a great one. Um, but right now, all the models we build with this for production use have an ODE model, have a compartmental model, have a system dynamics model behind them. And it's a stochastic one. It has some stochastics in it, some variability that's uncertain. Um, and what we do is we subscript to the model. So each stock there, instead of just being susceptible, we have a susceptible sub one, a susceptible sub two, a susceptible sub three. It's subscripted, okay? And there's an I sub one, I sub two, I sub three, and uh, R sub one, R sub two, R sub three. And, um, and basically susceptible sub one flows into I sub one, and I sub one flows into R sub one. So the mod whole model is subscripted. It's like it's, there's layers of this model where each layer has a separate version of the model. And they evolve as solitudes between observations. They don't care about each other. They just evolve. Each particle evolves. So each of these subscripts is for a particular particle. Now, there's a lot of particles. <laughs> so for the province and for PHAC and FNIB, we basically have about 150,000 particles per model. Yeah. It's a lot of part of, a lot of these competing hypotheses, a lot of them jockeying to best explain the data, okay? And in general, the bigger the model, the more stocks, the more, more particles you need to kind of have different views about all sorts of different things about, about the model. And each particle has its own copy of the model state. It carries around its full belief about how many people are in this stock, that stock, that stock, that stock. It has a complete belief about it. And another particle will have a different belief. Okay, now between the observations, all the particles just evolve. They just go, they just run the system dynamics rules and they just evolve uh, according to that. They don't care about any other particles. Now it's at the observation points, that's the rub. That's where the action takes place, okay? Um, for each particle here, each particle is this complete hypothesis about the state. And basically you're gonna multiply its weight by the likelihood of observing the data right then, um, given that particle state. So given this latest bit of data, you're gonna kind of compare what is the particle think should happen, should have happened with what actually happened. And if, if, it's, if that particle's thinking about the world as such that what we actually observe for the world is quite likely to happen, its weight will be multiplied by a value much closer to one. But if there's a particle that's saying, I expect to see something radically different from what's actually observed, its weight will be multiplied by a very small likelihood and become even smaller. Okay, so these, um, this weight is sort of reflecting its credibility again, and um, it's updated based on these observations. 
it's not that any particle changes its mind. No particle changes its mind. The particles believe hard. They are bullheaded. They, they just think this is the case. But their credibility is adjusted according to their weight. And then occasionally, with based on this criteria called the effective sample size, there's kind of time to pay the piper. It's kind of, um, there's an accounting that's due. Um, there's judgment day for the particles. And the particles with high weight uh, are going to be preferentially reproduced. Uh, and those with low weights tend to disappear. Basically, we sample from the particle with a probability of pulling each, each one proportional to its weight. So if it has a very small weight, our chance of grabbing it to survive is very low. But if it has a high weight, we might get it many, many times. And we start with many clones of it, and each of them evolve uh, separately. So these particles kind of represent these jockeying hypotheses. And at the resampling step, there's this uh, accounting. And when we look at the distribution, we look at the distribution, uh, we count a particle that has a weight twice as big as another one is counting twice as much towards that distribution. So um, when we summarize like the distribution, what is the model things going on with the number of, of undiagnosed infectives? If we look at the distribution over that, the voice of a particle with a weight of uh, 0.5 is twice as loud and counts twice as much in that distribution as the voice of a particle with a weight of half that, of 0.25. So it, it has a, the ones with larger weights have louder voices in shaping that distribution. They're, they're sampled more. So it leads to a distribution um, over the particles where not each particle is, is treated as equal, but the particles with higher weights are treated as, as uh, having the credibility associated with the weights, having that, that um, strength to their voice. They're, they're represented that much more. And this is based on something called importance sampling, which does exactly that. It weights these particles to form a certain distribution, weights these samples. Um, and it turns out you can do this to not only sim characterize what's going on right now, but to characterize trajectories over time, like histories, possible histories for understanding what has happened in Saskatchewan from back to a year ago, all the way through to now. So at the resampling step, there's this kind of dying out of some particle lineages with low weights, and some of them are multiplied many times, seed the new round of particles, and then evolve independently, because it is stochastic. They, they evolve independently. OK, um, so with, with that bit of understanding on the technical side, models. Um, that we have are based on these compartmental models. Uh, they are used for these multiple parties. And there's several versions of models we have applied um, provincially, regionally, and even for small area geographies like Lalash Clearwater, where we're uh, responding to needs in an outbreak response. Um, and um, I wish I had time to go into this more. Um, these are extremely. Uh, extremely uh, uh, grounded models, um, you know, really evolved through the crucible of tons of discussions about what's really going on in the ground. Um, there's a couple interesting features. Uh, one of them is they had to deal with travel cases a lot and the stochastics associated with the arrival of travel cases. Um, they, they have data from a lot of health system quantities like cases, test volumes, um, hospital and ICU census and admissions deaths, but now they also have wastewater data for um, for a version of the model that will soon probably start to get used increasingly in production. Um, one interesting thing is test data is central to these to how many cases are found in these models. The idea is, look, you're going to find more people if you test more, and so you have to consider tests. How many tests are being done? particularly if you're gonna set up a drive-through site. Yeah, okay, you set up a, two big drive-through sites, one in Saskatoon, one in Regina, you're gonna find more people. Does that mean more people are getting the bug and it's an emergency? No, it means you're more successful finding them. That's actually a good thing. And yet most models out there, in fact, 99% of COVID models out there ignore that link. They don't have the test data, so they 
they just treat it like, you know, more cases is a sign of more infections, um, which is can be really misleading sometimes. Um, so test data is, is, is really critical here for understanding that. And we're privileged to have test data regionally and uh, for the province uh, shared with us. Um, there are some issues with attribution. Sometimes someone has flown into Saskatoon. They're actually from White Fox or they're from Pelican Narrows and they're attributed to being from Saskatoon incorrectly. And we have to, um, we have to um, deal with that. But these models are stochastic they, and they deal with likelihood functions and they can deal with uncertainties. They can deal with the slings and insults of limited data quality. Um, hospitalization here is how, how it's treated is, is important. Um, and I wish I had time to go into this more, but um, the basic idea is we have this, this model which separates people with uh, outright symptomology or, or symptoms enough that they know they're sick from people who are what are called oligo or, or pausy or outright asymptomatic. And, th and that's this upper flow. Um, and, and there's a large fraction, about 40% of people who are probably along this flow. Um, the folks on this call, many of you carrying yet the blush of youth. Um, many of you, if you caught COVID-19, bear in mind, would be up in this area. You wouldn't have outright symptoms. And that's uh, a blessing and a curse, right? It, it's, it's, uh, you, you're unlikely to end up in the hospital, but you are, uh, you are quite likely to not know you're infected when you are. Maybe dismiss you know, some sniffles as from snow mold. And if you go see someone um, who's more vulnerable, because they have a chronic disease or they're much older, what have you, um, you could put them at real risk. Bear that in mind. Uh, so it's not that like 40% of people are up here and it's much higher for young people, uh, particularly children. Um, but this is the pathway for people of outright symptoms. And some of them go on to need hospitalization um, and either in the uh, intensive care unit or not in the intensive care unit. Now, beyond those, there are these uh, states up here these IA3, D, et cetera, where, which uh, IA, D, these are for diagnosed people. So we have to um, distinguish in this case between people who are undiagnosed and diagnosed because diagnosed people are unlikely to be circulating as much. They know they have COVID. By diagnosed, they've been giving a test and been shown to be COVID positive, for example. So hopefully they're reducing their circulation. And also the transitions to that stage are where we know about them. That's like when we learn that there's a person here who has COVID. And that can occur, can occur going to the hospital, but it can also occur going just a diagnosis because of testing. And there's a lot of system dynamics, flows, stocks and flows here. It's in any logic, but there's you know ODEs behind it. And there's a lot of kind of um, dynamic variables, intermediate variables that are calculated based on these states. These are all stocks and these are all things uh, that are that are based on them. Now, the thing to recognize here is that remember each particle has a complete hypothesis about this. Each particle says, "I think there's this many susceptibles, this many exposed persons, this many pre-symptomatic people, this many people who have are infected, infective, and outright symptomatic, this many people who are post symptomatic early stage, this many post symptomatic later stage." It has, it has this belief about the world. So each particle has this kind of vector. If we kind of labeled each of those as a position of the vector, it says, I think this is the case. And another particle right now, and another particle will say, no, I think this is the case. And they have these, these hypotheses. We also have something we call, um, and it, it's, it's subject to critique, dynamic parameters. But these are basically things which kind of function as parameters like C the contacts per day, um, or C beta. This is really C beta together for those uh, familiar who remember back to infectious disease models. But this evolves over time and it evolves in ways we can't predict. We, we don't know what, how many people are gonna get a gatherings on, you know, on, on Easter. Um, we don't know how many people are, 
are going to be out and about without masks and sitting in a neighbor barbecues or, or attending Aunt Millie's uh, dinner party. Uh, we're not sure what the contact rate is. And so we treat it as evolving um, in, a, in a random walk. And we do this particle filtering to estimate what is it really at any one time. The particles have different theories about what it is. And similarly with the number going to hospitalization. A very important point here is that we don't treat hospitalization um, as occurring with a certain fraction of people getting, being diagnosed with COVID-19 because it's fungible. I mean, what, what hospitalization really depends on is a certain fraction of the underlying people are infective, not the number of people that are found to have COVID-19. If, if a lot more people, um, uh, for example, said, I'm not going to bother with testing. I'm not going to go to the drive through sites. That wouldn't lower the number that are going to the hospital. The number going to the hospital is pretty independent of how many people you know, volunteer to get tested because people who go to the hospital are serious enough that even if you're not going and finding them, like in drive through sites or contact tracing, they're going to find you. They're going to come to the hospital no matter what. It's a fraction of the infective people. It's not a fraction of the cases that are found, which does depend on the vagaries of how many you found when looking actively, et cetera. OK, um, time is running on. I do want to get to the, um, to the stage of this, which is, is based on um, some infrastructure. Um, but suffice it to say, we have these random walks going on on, on these factors. We have, we have this model of travel related cases coming in stochastically. We have test data, which really factors in this in multiple ways. Um, I argued that it's, it's needed. Um, There's several ways in which it uh, affects things. You know, um, uh, if we test, we will, you know, learn about people and can isolate them. Uh, that's really good, um, but we'll also find more people. Um, and if more people get infected, um, you know, we we will we will find more who walk in, for example, to the hospital. And we really divide things up here into two types of um, uh, two types of situations: cases where we find you as an infective, or you find us. Um, one, the first is called active case finding. We go and we beat the bushes, right? We do contact tracing and we try to find infectives or we do drive through sites and try to get people to come, et cetera. We're, we're going out and trying to get people, get people tested. Passive case finding is like someone shows up at the hospital or someone shows up at their doctor's office with a miserable uh, you know, symptoms and they get tested. And really, um, there's uh, for passive testing, there's some that come in, they have shortness of breath. They have, um, your heart is just racing like crazy. Um, uh, they have issues with a terrible cough that's killing them and, and keeping them up at night. Those are kind of obligatory cases. I mean, like we've, we've got to deal with them. They're going to they're gonna come in any case. And then there's elective cases that are kind of, you know, I think as a good citizen, I should, I should get tested. I, if this, it's, it's not that bad. It's kind of like a cold, but it's, you know, it could be COVID-19. I'm going to that, you know, that Thanksgiving dinner and going to that uh, Easter dinner and I, I, I better get tested. Um, and so we, we distinguish between the two in this and uh, the obligatory ones, they're going to find us. It's not going to depend on how much we're beating the bushes with tests. They're, they're going to be coming in. The ones that are elective, um, a lot of them will, will come in on their own. Um, it will depend somewhat on how much we, we spread awareness of COVID-19. Um, but then we have active case finding where we're going and find people, you know, door to door, like in the Lush Clearwater, mass testing, um, um, you know, with, with contact tracing, et cetera. And in this case, we have a, a certain model that kind of characterizes how many people we find. It basically reflects the fact, look, if we test more, we'll find more people. But we don't, if we test twice as much, we're not going to find twice as many. It'll, there's kind of a diminishing return. So it will become harder and harder to find people, uh, to find each additional 1% of people um, over time, because we'll be 
finding people increasingly who are less uh, less less willing to to be subject to this sort of testing um, aren't going to return the calls from contact tracing or what have you. Um, and so we estimate these parameters in the, the particle filtering and it evolves over time. Um, so we basically have these different flows for we find you, you find us, and how test data factors into that is different. And since March, ladies and gentlemen, of last year, 2020, we've been looking, we've been begging, we've been entreating for information to allow us to find in terms of the case numbers, how many were found with active versus passive case finding. And there's a lot of hemming and hawing and saying, yeah, we probably could give that data. Um, it's probably it's somewhere in the health system. We could divide it, but there's not enough people to enter it right now. And you know, they need to hire four more people and we can't afford it. And, and um, then eventually it, it was collected, but it was collected on paper. And so we couldn't easily get the paper. And, and, and then it, you know, turned into to um, uh, it was available, but not easily through our system or what have you. And we still haven't gotten it long short of it. Uh, maybe eventually someday over the rainbow, um, we'll be able to have this division and we'll ground our model a lot. So I said that, that particles weight, they have a complete thinking about a given particle says, I think there's this many people here. I think the contact rate is such and such. I think the fraction of people that are that will present for non-hospital care because of symptoms or such and such. Each particle is a complete hypothesis for what's going on in the world right now. And um, then we judge it when we see data right now. Um, we say, okay, so particle, how how did you how did you measure up against this data? How likely would this data to be produced for your thinking about the world? If, if what you're saying is true, to what degree does it square with this data we observe from the world? Um, and what we use here is something called the likelihood function. Um, this is a likelihood for those who have taken machine learning may recognize it. It says, what's the likelihood of observe, observing the sort of empirical data from the world in light of the true situation posited by this particular particle as being the case under the covers and behind the scenes. And uh, we have uh, distributions used here that are predominantly what are called negative binomial distributions. And you can kind of adjust with this thing called the dispersion parameter, how wide that distribution is, how accommodating it is to data that disagrees with it that is kind of far off or how, how strict and narrow. And as you change this dispersion parameter, it gets kind of more and more particular. All of these have a mean of a thousand, but this one like stretches from zero way down. It's even got some visible up at 3000. This one's, you know, it kind of peters out around between 2000 and 2500 and it doesn't go all the way down to zero. This one yeah, barely goes up to 2000 in any significant amount. And so we can tune this dispersion parameter. And if you ask me what I was doing in midnight um, uh, between uh, March and about August, uh, a fair bit of it was tuning things like this and running it and trying to improve particle filter performance until ladies and gentlemen, Shayan and I made this particle filter sing. Uh, with respect to the data. Now this likelihood function um, uh, is, uh, is something that takes, has many components. And basically for each type of data, we have a different component. Um, the latest one is for wastewater. And it's, it's really neat because we get wastewater data from here in Saskatoon thrice a week. And we were just on the horn two days ago with Regina about possibly getting their wastewater data. And, we're hoping to do it for Swift Current and Moose Jaw and PA, et cetera. Um, uh, and there's a lot of people interested in that across the country. But beyond that, we have likelihood functions for cases uh, that, are, um, uh, that are new or, or cumulative um, uh, admissions to a non-ICU non hospital or ICU, uh, et cetera. And you know, basically you judge a particle by how well it matches up against each and every bit of this data that's available right now. 
And sometimes data like wastewater isn't available for a given day. So we just drop this part of it. And we essentially treat it as one and we multiply it by the others. So this is used to adjust the weights. And I, I'm not gonna go into this, but these are negative binomial distributions, which are, um, which are ways of kind of accommodating some give, um, but rewarding things that are closer. So you may remember that each particle has its own full copy of, of, of model state. So each particle here has this current thinking about the state. And at a given time, we'll see two different things, one cases and one hospital census. And we will judge that particle's thinking. I'll say, you know, um, this is the empirical data. Um, and we'll say, how, what would the particle think the chances were we'd observe that data? Maybe for this particle, 0.22 for this first one and 0.25. That's 0.75 for the second one, this hospital census. So maybe that, that's for you know each of two things here, this new cases and hospital census, this guy, the, the non-ICU hospital census. Um, so we take that into account. And if these were the only two types of data for that day, we would multiply them to get this and for, for this particle. And we would then update its prior weight to its, its new weight and give it an updated weight. And the same thing would happen with these other particles. Um, and some of these particles might have predicted something much closer to the data, like this 0.5 was bang on the mark. But this particle was out to lunch. It was, it was you know, it's out in outer space. Um, and, uh, and so it's updating the, um, the um, it's going to be updating it with a very, very small, uh, small likelihood. And it's going to have a very small weight. This particle is ripe to be, to not survive in the survive to the fittest. So over time, what does this model give? Well, it gives things like the effective reproductive number over time. It takes the model estimate for what past data was telling it in the new estimate or the new data from the world and kind of creates a consensus estimate. So it's always taken into account, not just new data, but, but the old data is kind of built into its estimates of, of the, the, what the particles are saying, what, what their weights are. And it's always taking in this new data and getting new, new updates, uh, new, new sense of what this distribution is. And this is what's called a box plot. So at any one time, it has some variability with it. And we do it for undiagnosed infectives or force of infection. And we can do it for wastewater data and have the model match, you know, try to match up wastewater data, make sense of wastewater data together with all the other evidence. And this is kind of pinning down the model in different areas of the model. We're pinning it down, you know, so there's a little wiggle room for, for misinterpreting things. We're giving a, a, a clear and clear, clear view of what's going on out there in the world about this, about that, about that part of the model, that part, but the different parts of the elephant. We're, we're figuring out what's going on across the entire elephant. And uh, I will tell you that, you know, without wastewater data to ground this, we don't do as good a job and its expectations are, are off. The wastewater data does improve our ability to anticipate health system data and number of cases beyond obviously interpreting, uh, anticipating wastewater data. So what can you use a model like this for? Well, one thing is kind of tomography. It's kind of like you have this CAT scan machine. CAT scan machine works with not just one image. It's not like an X-ray, you get an X-ray of your broken leg and you can see it, um, see where the fracture is. Uh, and a CAT scan machine gets X-rays from all these different directions. That's why it's kind of this round thing. It, it snaps them from all these images. And it, the real beauty of it comes when you link those all together to get a 3D model. Any one image is flawed. Any one image is limited. Any one image has shadows on it cast by these metal screws or uh, shadows in it cast by the field of view or the fact that there's bone between this. But it's together, they give this complete picture. And it's kind of like that with real world data. Any given sort type of data is really limited, but together and together with the theory of how COVID evolves and you know how behavior translates into hospital cases versus non-hospital cases, now tests 
increase the number of early stage cases we find through active case finding. The model kind of gives this picture of what's going on across this whole series of different, different things. So it kind of gives this 3D view of what's going on out there in the world um, across all these different uh, measurements. We can also though take that model and project forward. We've learned up till now when we project forward to anticipate what's likely to happen over the next week, the next two weeks with the momentum of the system because dynamic systems have momentum, right? The momentum reflects the inertia and stops. And if we run it forward, we'll see the system evolve in a way that kind of captures that momentum. We won't know how behavior will evolve over the next two weeks, but a lot of what's gonna play out over the next two weeks is people who are sick right now because they got infected a couple of days ago or whatever. And, and we can anticipate what does that likely mean in terms of ICU demand? If wastewater is telling us quite a few people are in the early stage of infection right now, and it does detect people within, many people believe within a day or two of infection, then we're going to be able to anticipate over the next two weeks how that will flow through in ways we could never do from the data by itself. The data doesn't tell us how it's gonna evolve. A model captures that logic about how it's gonna evolve. And we can do this with service delivery, um, things like uh, hospitalization numbers, non-ICU hospitalizations or ICU admissions, et cetera. Um, and finally, we can ask what if questions. Um, we can ask questions about, you know, if we undertook a mask mandate, for example, or if we restricted mobility between regions, if we had a regional model running. So what underlies all of this? Well, what underlies all of this is remarkable, ladies and gentlemen, and should warm your hearts as computer scientists, because there's a lot of wonderful computational stats and, and modeling here. That's also true to, com to computer science. But beyond that, there's this infrastructure built up to do this at scale for in an industrial sort of way um, and to do it in a very reproducible way, in a way that's in, to some degree fault tolerant, allowing us to, to retry things that have failed in a way that's semi-automated. And this involves data ingestion processes, some behind firewalls like associated with the health authority, um, data coming from various national sources, some public sources, some you know, sources shared with us privately, and includes wastewater data coming in. And these things go into into files uh, or databases. And basically we can put these together into these particle filters running um, for a given province or a given health authority. Right now we used to have regularly uh, different regions that's kind of in abeyance uh, at the moment, but we'll probably revive it. And this goes on to automatically produce reports through our scripting, et cetera. Um, and it's quite uh, an impressive infrastructure that uh, Loutier originally built up and Aaron Todorash and Eric Redekop, Ben Camplin uh, and Vion Patel have, have taken forward uh, together with some continued involvement through, uh, through Loutier's um, incredible knowledge about this and, and uh, fundamental enablement. So this includes data ingestion and post pre-processing scripting. Um, data quality checks and kind of checks on the consistency of the runs that you're trying to run. Like you're not, you have data that's consistent with the dates that you're running. Um, so it just doesn't fail. Um, it'll, it'll spot inconsistencies early on. Um, through uh, distributed computing, we can run this on different machines at the same time, um, spit it into different machines and um, Occasionally, you may see <laughs> some runs related to this for FNIB or, or uh, PHAC uh, running on uh, Tux machines, for example, um, uh, we, or, or trucks. Um, there's scripting that goes on post-processing to turn it into these, you know, all these visuals and all these reports to put together emails that can be sent to the stakeholders. And there's accumulation of metadata and these uh, Google Sheets, for example, on each run, uh, what scenario it was run with, who launched it, that kind of keeps us sane. 
there's logging that goes on as to what has gone on during a model and, and uh, during a run and mechanisms for restarting it, archiving and distribution to clients. We also have done some work on model visualization tools to allow interactively and hopefully soon collaboratively people to kind of um, inspect the results from this, make sense of this population tomography. What is it telling us about this, about that? How many people might be undiagnosed and sick in this city? How many cases of a variant might we see in that city or what have you? Um, uh, now, this required um, this work, particularly in its early months. And I, I've got to credit uh, Xiaoyan and Lu Jie for their uh, incredible work with me on this. We had to take a lot of tacit concepts that we have as modelers and make them explicit in this framework. Things like separating up projection runs from runs that over the entire time span, from runs that are incremental and just add in more data versus intervention scenarios. These are different types of scenarios that I don't know is being documented anywhere, but we had to kind of realize, well, wait a minute, we have to capture these in the software structures. We have to treat these differently. The needs are different associated with them. And we have to you know, have this differential characterization of the model versions and different data sources and which runs depend on which previous run. So if you have an incremental run that extends a previous run, we capture that. You know, what scripts do you want to run for which client, which email distribution list? And Eric and Aaron and Lugia, um, you know, have, have really gone to town to, to, to really pin this down and, and make the system very easy to use and very productive. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we have turned around. So this system is in use daily uh, for our province. And since summer, it's been distributed to hundreds of people a day throughout our province, including the topmost people in the Ministry of Health and, uh, and uh, people throughout the SHA. Um, and it's paid attention to quite a lot. Um, and periodically, we, we go and we um, uh, rerun some of the, the longer runs. Um, there's some ongoing work associated with this that I, I don't have time to, uh, to, to talk about. Particle filtering with ABM is something we'd like to do, and we believe it can be done, but it requires uh, an appropriate um, level of scale that um, requires a real attention to, to performance issues. Um, a lot of lessons have been learned. The fundamental one though here that I really want you to absorb is the value in turning models from discrete products into services, services that, that constantly provide new insights by ingesting new data and that are updated. Um, and uh, that has been a game changer for our health authority. Uh, it's been a game changer for the ministry being able to have these estimates provided in this industrial strength way, reflecting the very latest data and have quick turnaround. And that has depended on our skills of computer scientists as much as uh, and for infrastructure as much as it has on, on modeling. Um, there's a lot of other um, lessons to be learned here. Um, uh, to weigh carefully results that have changed a lot, how you introduce them. Um, and uh, the, the need to build up infrastructure in parallel with the modeling. Um, th the risk that people fixate on particular numbers that vary stochastically and the need to educate people about modeling, about how modeling is best used, how to interpret the results and how to use uh, additional metrics. Um, we've also learned a lot technically about uh, the number of particles required um, the, the, the machines that we require for it, um, uh, the, the degree to which novel data sources such as wastewater can be useful, et cetera. Um, we are evolving the system. Um, uh, Lugia has demonstrated speed ups of dozens of times with particle filtering for these sort of models and, um, using GPUs. Uh, graphical processing units such as are available on many commodity machines now. And um, we're looking for a next generation that could, could leverage that. 
enriching our data sources um, further, including with things like search volume data, Google and Apple mobility data fed into it, and variant specific um, types of data. Uh, we're also looking to move beyond just any logic models. Okay, a few conclusions here. Models gain a lot of additional value if they're used for service provision. They're not things that you build and then just kind of use um, and grow increasingly outdated in their original characterization, but if they're constantly updated. And you know, infrastructures built properly can fundamentally enable that at scale, at a scale that um, supports industrial sort of level turnaround for for many clients with diverse needs. Particle filtering is really well suited for undertaking that sort of service delivery with many public health data streams. And the sorts of models you've built in this class um, can be leveraged with particle filtering to turn them into these ongoing service delivery vehicles. Um, now, uh, particle filtering can perform at different levels of the system and uh, but it's not a turn the crank process. It, it does require tuning and learning. And a lot of the reasons I have added gray hairs now when I was up past midnight pretty much every night from for six months straight was, was to tune these things and make them sing. And Xiaoyan uh, and Lujia had many conversations with me past midnight to, to do that. And we succeeded, um, but um, you know it is something that's to be expected, this, this level of tuning. Reporting pipelines such as supported by these infrastructures can allow for efficient data, data ingestion, reporting and, and uh, interactive exploration. Um, but these things need to be performed at scale. And I wanna finish this presentation by again, thanking those who have contributed to this effort, some in this class, others shown here, uh, Jeremy taking a lead with PMCMC uh, and Xiao Yan and uh, the broader support of our um, Cephal Lab and Christine Hillis here for, for really making this, uh, this work possible. Okay, that's all we have time for today. Um, hope that's given a glimpse of how models can be used with machine learning, ongoing data to sort of give a best of both worlds. And um, in this age of big data, to accommodate growing variety and richness of data streams such as are afforded to us as computer scientists and how the skills of anyone on this call uh, as computer scientists can help leverage this effort. So thank you very much. Um, hope that's been useful. Uh, I will start office hours within just a couple minutes here. Um, and if anyone's interested in learning more then happy to talk, always happy to talk uh, outside of class as well. Thank you very much, folks. And uh, stay safe in this uh, variant era. Okay, take care, Bill.